Good evening, New Orleans, and welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Over the next hour, we're going to break it down for you. We're going to cover all the home teams. We'll talk about the New Orleans Saints. We'll talk about the New Orleans Pelicans. We'll take a look at the recruiting classes of LSU and Tulane. We've got some great guests to break it down for you. John Hendricks of, of uh, the Biloxi Sun-Herald and Who Dat Dish is with us, along with Coach Rick Gailey of SportsNola.com and a whole lot of other stuff. We're going to let you tell them all about it. Guys, welcome to the show as always. Thanks so much for being with us. And uh, we always like to start the show off letting uh, the audience know a little bit about what you're involved in. John, why don't you take it first, let the folks know what you're doing. Good deal. So I'm a managing editor of Who Dat Dish, uh, part of the Fan Sided Network, which is picked up by Time Incorporated uh, not too long ago. I've been with the site for over three years and also do freelance work for the Sun Herald and most recently done a little bit of stuff on WDSU, writing some columns for the Saints. Beautiful. Coach? You got a long list of stuff you're involved in, my friend. Let it fly. Yes, indeed. Well, I'll start with WH, uh, WH and OTV20, Prep Recruiting Insider with our friend Renee Nato. Uh, our fourth season with that. You got three weeks to go there. Uh, WGSO Radio with uh, Ken Trahan and Ed Daniels, the three tailgaters. Great addition. Oh, coach. yeah. That, uh, that is a lot of fun, really. Really keeps me on my toes. I have to study every week to. Keep up with those. Coach opinions. studies all the time. <laughs> That's all the time. Right. He's always studying. Yeah, at the end of every day, <laughs> yes. Eric, I, I amaze myself at how little I get done because I spend the whole day studying right. and, I'm, and I can't put my finger on it. That's why, it's why <laughs> you're a go to guy for all of us. <laughs> That's right. I got to get my play sheets in there order. <laughs> First play, 25 plays are scripted. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I write for sportsnola.com as well. Beautiful. Well, we're going to start with you, Coach. Uh, obviously, you and Renee do a great job in, in, on your recruiting show. We've had Renee on the show within the last couple of weeks. I'd like to get your take first on the LSU class, your thoughts. Well, they, they had an outstanding class, whether they're one, two, three, five, whatever. That, that, that can be pretty fluid, but they did a good, very good job of filling some voids, especially in the defensive line. They're going to need some more linebackers or continue to develop linebackers because Dave uh, Aranda, the defensive coordinator, loves defensive backs, but he really loves linebackers so he could play with them and, and really design some things there. But much better in the defensive line. So Ed Ogeron has got to be absolutely thrilled with the people he has there. Uh, the quarterback position, of course, becomes uh, the position of concern because mm -hmm. they have improved their team uh, realistically. Every team in the country uh, certainly feels that they've improved themselves, sure. but, uh, but LSU realistically has. But with signing Lindsey Scott uh, tells you that now LSU is, is in with both feet on mm -hmm. uh, athletic dual threat quarterbacks. He's going to be an outstanding addition. Well, what are is your it going to help him, him this year? What are uh, your thoughts? Because, yep. again, three-star guy, LSU was not on him. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this program. We've talked about it on the radio show. Uh, very intelligent young man. Right. Photographic memory. Could have went to Harvard or Tulane, okay, right. but decided to go to LSU. Uh, some are saying, obviously, the size is going to be a hindrance, but we, we see a guy in Drew Brees, obviously, right. where size has not affected him at all, especially when you got the type of intelligence that we hear this, this young man has. Well, how do you think he progresses from the high school to, to, to the college ranks? Is he a guy that sits his freshman year? Can he, can he come in and play right away? What are your thoughts? It's going to be very difficult for him to step in and play right away, especially because he's not there now. Uh, so he won't be participating in spring practice, but we'll be there in mm -hmm. summer. But it's going to be very difficult uh, for him to be able to uh, beat out the edge that Brandon Harris mm -hmm. has. So LSU is going to depend on Brandon Harris's improvement. Lindsey Scott will be a, is a playmaker, uh, and just like like you said, he can get a team uh, in and out uh, of formations and run uh, spread type attacks. Uh, the sh the ability to play in spread offenses, but especially out of the shotgun, has made the shorter quarterback. Mm -hmm much more usable. Uh, it's much more difficult from under the center if you're short than out of the gun. So I think he's a very, very fine addition. Coach, but they want to run a pro-style offense at LSU, and I'm always, not. I'm always <laughs> confused by that because they don't seem to get the signal car that fits what they're trying to do on offense. Right. They, they are going to, uh, with the quarterbacks that they have now, they can't be an eye formation, pure eye formation power team. I mean, they can run plays out of mm -hmm. it. Uh, but they're going to have to be more shotgun, as, as they were in the bowl game, as a matter of fact. Uh, that suits Leonard Fournette mm -hmm. uh, very well. He does not have to be in the eye formation, does, does very good out, out of shotgun. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ability of Harris to be able to run the football 
uh, on occasion makes the defense assign somebody to him on every play, yes. and that is much more effective out of the gun than it is from under the center. We know Harris struggled in his first year, uh, despite being an early entry. Last year, uh, you look at him, he got a little better as it went on. This has got to be the year where the lights come on, right? It has to be, absolutely. And when you, you look at, uh, at the roster, that, of course, becomes the key position. He's got to be able to make plays now. And uh, some people take longer than others. I mean, you're mm -hmm. looking for that point where talent and maturity cross. Mm -hmm. they, they, you, you just don't automatically mature. You know, some of us right. have never grown up. Uh, and you don't automatically, you don't <laughs> automatically get uh, better physically as well. You're looking for that, uh, that where those two things cross. So uh, we hope that with the repetition that Harris has had, it's just taking him a little longer, that he's going to be more effective this year. He has to be. Right. Now, now, Coach, you, you coaching in the high school ranks, one of the things we heard about Harris was uh, it was a very, very vanilla offense that he played in that spread. It relied right. on his athletic ability. Didn't really have to do reads, didn't have to have to, I mean, the, the digestion of, of a large playbook was not something he had to do. Right. And then he goes to LSU and boom, all of a sudden he's got to, you know, you talk about remedial classes when you get to college, all of a sudden right. he's got to go to remedial football class. Uh, is, is that realistic on, on why the slow start and why you believe that, that again, this upcoming year maybe could be the year the light comes on? The hardest job of coaching is evaluating what you have and then allowing them to do that and not do what they cannot do. That is really difficult. And, uh, and, and that's what makes good coaches good coaches and mediocre coaches mediocre. Mm -hmm. if they can't do that. They run what they want to run, and they do a very poor job of evaluating what they have. Uh, LSU, two years ago, did uh, Cam Cameron did a mediocre job at best in teaching the quarterbacks. A little bit better last year. Almost hit, just like he hit a wall mm -hmm. when he got, got to Alabama. I think maybe they got a little ahead of what he was capable right. of doing. Uh, there's a very fine line in being able to balance that out. It's the responsibility of the coaching staff to put things together that a player can mm -hmm. do. And no matter how good it is on paper, if a player can't perform it, you can't run it. Let's go to Tulane now. Coach Willie Fritz is uh, first class. He comes in a little bit late. Right. Uh, there's been a real emphasis on Louisiana players uh, under, under Curtis Johnson. Uh, he almost had to go in a different direction and, and go for what he knew. Your thoughts on their class? And he, he is full speed ahead with the athletic dual threat quarterback as well. He's going to want to run uh, option type things out of, out of shotgun especially. So that's retooling the quarterback position while Tanner Lee has, has transferred. So uh, Coach Fritz knows what he wants to do and the type of players that are necessary for him to be able to do that. He's going to have to learn, and the whole staff is going to have to learn how recruiting in New Orleans works. It's all about relationships, right. and you don't just come in and walk into any New Orleans school, a New Orleans area school, I'm not, right. I'm not talking about uh, inner city New Orleans, and say, here I am, I have a scholarship, let me recruit your players. There's a lot mm -hmm. of relationships that have to be built. So he was not only behind schedule and player but evaluation, but in developing those relationships as well. How does that happen, Coach? You, you've done it on the high school level. You coached at Tulane. Right. Um, how do those relationships built with new guys that are coming in, that are fresh, that have never been in Louisiana? You know, again, college, high school coaches in Louisiana are very welcoming, but, but yeah. how do you get in so that, you know, that they're there for you to, to, be, for, to be there when, when you need the phone call, when you need the information uh, and access? You've got to have good contacts that will lead you around because you won't learn it on your own. And so uh, you've got to have a good relationship with local people that know the, know the situation at each school and they bring you around and, and, and teach you. And there's nobody on the staff right now uh, at Tulane that has developed that right. yet. They will, but uh, they've got to be conscientious about it. They have to make sure though that you don't just recruit a local player because he's a local player. He's got to be good enough to begin with and, and, uh, and then include them more and more in your recruiting. Uh, they've got a way to go on that, but it is encouraging that Tulane is taking uh, players who fit in that gap between NCAA and Tulane right. standards. Okay, there's a, there's a bit of a gap yes. there. And so they're allowing students within that gap to go ahead and be recruited and signed mm -hmm. and enroll in school, and it's going to be the responsibility of the coaching staff to get kids that can live up to Tulane expectations but just need uh, need some work, need a little bit of time, but it's up to the coaching staff not only to find those people who can 
who are two lane caliber, maybe a little bit below the standard, but can live up to the two lane standard over time. Coach, thanks for the update on recruiting. We really appreciate it. Let's start. Let's turn our attention to the New Orleans Saints. We'll bring uh, John Hendricks into the conversation now. And some interesting moves with the Saints over the last few days. Not unexpected, considering again bonuses were due. Saints had to make a decision on they're going, whether they're going to keep players or they're not going to keep players uh, going forward. Uh, the first was the release of Brandon Browner. That was we found out about about that uh, the Friday before Mardi Gras uh, through uh, social media. Uh, the interesting one is what's been happening. We've found out more about some of the other cuts that have taken place. David Hawthorne was cut, Ramon Humber was cut, Sean Davis Jones, uh, and then Jerry Evans. The Jerry Evans situation, uh, supposedly according to his agent today, was on a Philadelphia radio station, uh, said that they were not willing to take a cut two years in a row. They took the first cut, but they were not willing to take, take the second cut. Uh, John, your thoughts on, on, on Jerry Evans? How much you think he has left in the tank, and was that a good decision in your mind on the part of Evans, who, who are now maybe eyeing the Philadelphia Eagles because he is a native of Philadelphia? Absolutely, and you think about uh, you know last year that there was talks that Evans was potentially a, a target of the Buffalo Bills, so that could be a team that you keep in, in mind for this. Um, but you know, ultimately, Jari Evans with the situation, you know, the Saints have made this bed that they're having to deal with that you know they're accruing more dead money with this contract, and Evans, you know. He went from being somebody who was an elite guard to just kind of a, a good, maybe average guard because the injuries have kind of taken their toll with Evans. And, uh, you know, that's the unfortunate, you know, truth of it all with him. And, and no personal feelings aside, you know, this is a business mm -hmm. that you have to run. So the Saints obviously, you know, either call his bluff about taking a pay cut and they feel that they need to move the direction elsewhere with Evans. Your thoughts, Coach. You've watched, you broke the film down each and every week. You right. saw Jerry Evans at his best when he was healthy. You saw him when he struggled when he was injured. How much do you believe he has left in the tank? And what kind of a move do you think this was for the New Orleans Saints? He's, he's got some because he played pretty good at the end mm -hmm. of the year, surprisingly so when you think he'd have gotten yes. worn down. But he had a little bit of sabbatical in there. Yes, he did. Uh, so yes, he did. He, you know, and, uh, in fact, the offensive line played pretty well at the end mm -hmm. of the year, but it might have been who they were playing against uh, as well. You know, I've, I've often wondered if that last quarter of the season wasn't fool's goal. But. Oh, it, it very <laughs> well could be. And uh, pro football focus, which a lot of sports writers use as a mm -hmm. Bible, I, I, I started laughing out loud when they had the Saints rated as the third best offensive mm -hmm. line in the league, followed closely uh, by Atlanta, mm -hmm. and not far behind that by Cleveland. And I'm going, what that, happened to those analysts? Yeah, they, well, they got a bunch of soccer guys <laughs> talking to try to figure out what <laughs> offensive linemen is supposed to do. Uh, and, and if they were the third best offensive line, Brett Angles wouldn't have gotten fired. No. Right. There, there's, there's your tail, tell, yeah. telltale mm -hmm. sign. No doubt. Right there. But he played better at the end of the year. In fact, I was amazed how much better the Saints offense did after Breeze had the plantar fasciitis, yes. had the foot injury, that mm -hmm. he, he played when he played better from the, each week. He was more decisive. Mm -hmm. He was stepping up in the pocket more because yes. that offensive line was getting shuffled around all mm -hmm. over the place. We found out that Andrews Pete uh, is going to be able to play in the league. Mm -hmm. I don't know at what level right now, but he's, he's got some capability. Calamente and Lolito have some ability. I'm not sure they're starters in right. the NFL. Or if I'd want to go into the season with one at right guard, one at left guard, right. and say giddy up. And neither are under uh, contract right now. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and but you know, I'm, you know, there's a lot of people that, mm. that Saints are going to have to depend on that aren't under contract yes. right now. Uh, of course, Evans was scheduled to count $8.2 million against the uh, the cap. That's about $5.1 million in dead money they'll be added. Uh, depending on, on when they cut, with the official cut, uh, the new year for the NFL is on March the 9th. If they cut them after March 9th and designate them as a post-June 1st cut, they can split that, um, that dead money over two seasons. You mentioned something in, 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 uh, before we, went, we came on the air today. Evans was scheduled to be the highest paid guard in the NFL? That's correct. He has $8.2 million. At uh, 33 years old, he was going to be the league's top paid guard. So let that sink in a little bit and what you expect out of somebody who is going to be the top paid guard for sure. $2 million uh, base salary, again, also uh, would have been fully guaranteed if they would not have made the move to cut him. A million dollar roster bonus also would have taken effect. That'll be next month with David Hawthorne. He, uh, again, was inconsistent as a player. Your thoughts on, on the cutting of Hawthorne? Once again, a cap move on the part of the Saints. Absolutely. And, you know, you look at some of these moves, and it just it speaks to the, the front office and kind of the failures that we've had over free agency. I mean, David Hawthorne was a guy, came over from the Seahawks after having stellar seasons mm -hmm. of triple-digit sacks, and uh, he'd come in and 
you know, really just didn't, he was underwhelming is basically what it had. And then he had a chance to take the team's starting middle linebacker position. He lost that to Stephon mm -hmm. Anthony, you right. know, which is a credit to Stephon Anthony. But again, Hawthorne was a part-time guy. They really had a lot of problems mixing in people with weak side linebacker. And Hawthorne was kind of shifted all over. And it was just really tough to watch. Your thoughts on Hawthorne? And we find out how important the weak side linebacker oh. is. Not the weak side outside backer. Right. We're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. about the inside backer that uh, Danelle Ellaby showed how, that mm -hmm. the defense vastly improved when he's yes. in the game. And I think his contract's interesting because now he, his, his, he doesn't get real money unless he plays 80% of the mm -hmm. defensive snaps. So I think that that's a pretty good structure yes. there. Uh, not that he needs the incentive. I mean, NFL players want to play. They want to play, right. You know, that's, but but uh, you, you're looking at a backup linebacker in Hawthorne. Uh, it's just slightly better than Ramon Humber, mm -hmm. except Humber was better in special teams. Yes. Uh, you know, Humber got cut too. Yes. And Chant he's been cut about three or four times. Yeah, he's by been the one Saints. that's been a revolving door yeah, for him. Yeah, because he, he serves a good role. He doesn't right. need many snaps in practice. Can fill in when he needs to fill in. Is good on special teams. But that weak side inside linebacker position is a big, big void amongst many other voids. Right. And we're going to talk about it as we go forward. Uh, as far as Jari Evans goes, uh, the Saints will save $3.1 million against the cap uh, this year for, for, uh, for cutting him. Uh, the David Hawthorne, they'll save $2.25 million there. Uh, as far as Ramon Humber, his, his contract was minimal. And, he, and that leads me to believe, guys, that he won't be designated as a June 1st cut. They'll probably take the money, the hit on, on, on his money immediately. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, this is just how the, the front office works and these types of strategies when you release players. You know, this salary cap is, is a game of numbers. That's exactly what it is. Right. It's a business decision, what you look at. Um, and speaking about somebody like Humber, somebody that comes to mind that can maybe fill that special mm -hmm. teams role, not jumping ahead totally, finishing Sari. Yes. Somebody who's been hurt, Great but call. he's coming back, mm -hmm. and he's doing really good in rehab. So maybe right. that's a good reason that they feel good about him. Right. Uh, Humber's dead money is 167000 which is which leads you to believe right. that they'll absorb that now. The, the one that maybe caught a lot of people by surprise, and Coach, you and I happened to talk about it on my radio show on the day it happened, is the release of Brandon Browner. Not because uh, of his play on the field, because I think a lot of us wanted him to get released in the middle of the season, but it's the dead money uh, that, that, that the Saints are going to eat. They structured the contract guaranteeing him money, right. even though he would, uh, if he wouldn't have made it through the full three years of the deal, he has to make it through one year of the deal, and, and of course he's been released. Your thoughts? Well, the, the term dead money, it, 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 Oof, if there's any term in football, dead weight. <laughs> yeah, if there's any term in football, it's more appropriate than dead money. And yes. the Saints are, are swimming in it. We talked about mm -hmm. uh, before that uh, they could finance a third world country with the dead money. That Pretty they much. Have. Uh, About 22.4 million ooh. right now in dead money for 16. 27.7 million uh, if, if Browner's money, right. which is expected to go post June 1st. I mean, that, that, that you know, you're starting off with 12 million in, in the hole with a Junior Gallet situation. But five, right. what 5.35 million is going to be the the, uh, the the money that the Saints will eat on on Browner. Obviously, Dennis Allen believes that in what he wants to do and what the other players can do. Because once again, a coach has got to balance out what he can do with all the other players, especially mm -hmm. defensively. And you've got to be able to blend in all the different talents. And what he wants to do, Brandon Browner cannot do. You felt all season long, because we talked about it a couple times on this show and many times on the radio show, they just didn't utilize him correctly, did they? He's very limited in what he can do, but what he does is very good. He has to play close to the line of scrimmage where he can be physical and not worry so much about getting beat deep, or if he has help coming from the inside, he knows that he can bail and keep the receiver in front of him. You've always got a scheme to help Browner uh, in, in down the field coverage, mm -hmm. especially, but give him stuff that he's supposed to do. New England was, was a classic. Mm -hmm. Well, Seattle before that, but New England as well, that uh, they would put him on his side and give him help all the time and let the corner to the other side uh, play one-on-one, -on -one. and the Saints obviously couldn't do that last year. Your thoughts on Brandon? I, I think one of the big things here is, is Keenan Lewis, that injury with the hip and then right. the MCL. I think that was a big part of it because obviously, you know, when we looked at, at preseason and everything, Delvin Bro was just a guy. Mm -hmm. We didn't know he was going to do what he did. But I think that had a lot to do with it. And then, you know, I think of Jarius Bird talking to the media, a couple of things where he talks about how there was a lot of confusion and a lot of miscommunication 
you know, defensively. And it's some of the things that we don't see. So clearly, there's a lot of breakdowns in the secondary. But uh, I think they made the right choice, obviously. I think everybody in New Orleans can agree mm -hmm. there. But, you know, how they handle it going forward with, you know, somebody like maybe P.J. Williams mm -hmm. comes and steps in, mm -hmm. that, that, that remains to be seen. But that's another hole that they have. Coach mentioned Danell Ellaby. He takes a pay cut, created about $2.7 million in cap space. He's got a $1.7 million base salary with a $750,000 uh, roster bonus and a $50,000 workout bonus. His base salary is guaranteed, but the bonuses obviously are not. Uh, John, your thoughts on uh, on Ellaby? Uh, you know, when he played, uh, the defense played well, but the problem is you never could count on him. Just like you had, the Dolphins weren't able to count on him, just like the Ravens weren't able to count on him. Yeah, and it seems to be a, a common theme for free agency fines sometimes. And, and Ellaby was acquired via trade, but you know they've gotten some of these players that rolled all dice on that have had some injury history. You know they got lucky with Max Hunger with something along that lines, but with Ellaby, you know it was just one of the things. Mm -hmm. He makes a huge difference when he's in the lineup. There's no question about that. You have to have a weak side linebacker that can cover the tight end, that can diagnose all those different types of run coverage, mm -hmm. and you know in pass coverage, play QB spies, all those different things. But when he was out there, you saw a rotation. I mean, you had Chris Chambers. I mean, I'm sorry, not. I'm going way back. Yeah, excuse are. me. <laughs> but you had, uh, you yeah, know, you senior had Ramon. Moment, I know. You're I'm way really too young for that. Yeah. Uh, you and me, Mary <laughs> Ramon Humber. I was thinking about Dead Money and Crazy yes. Mrs. That's what happened. Yeah. Ramon Humber. You had James Anderson come in there. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, Michael Maudy filling right. that void. I mean, you had all these guys. You had Jolon Dunbar that mm -hmm. come in. So you see all these different rotations that they had to, you know, factor in without Ellaby. So it, it just speaks to yeah. why they really need to have somebody solid there. Coach, uh, anything you can add about Ellaby? I know you did mention it briefly before. It's amazing how many positions are, are, are going to depend this year on good health. Yes. People coming back True. from injury. Uh, you could think last year with all the people that they had to play defensively, maybe they did develop some depth. <laughs> because you, they got you, a, you would hope. <laughs> yeah, you're looking, you're looking at the flip card and say, who is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on occasion. Uh, a lot, I have some questions with the Saints about their medical staff because I thought that was a big advantage back in, in, the, in the early Sean Payton era that uh, they were able to get some people uh, that other, pe other teams wouldn't take advantage of. Yeah. Brees, the biggest one. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've, t they've either misdiagnosed both for the Pelicans as well as the Saints, oh, yes. uh, take it, done some procedures uh, like the microdiscectomy right immediately mm -hmm. with Jarris Bird. So I've got some questions going forward about uh, the Saints medical staff, which at one time was a strength, and now I'm not so certain. Well, you know, Coach, I've expounded on that on, on my radio show and on this show, and look, no, no slight to Ashta Hospital, which has done some great work in this town. There's no doubt about it, and it employs a lot of people. But so does Tulane University. There was a time when Tulane University had, had the sponsorship, and we just didn't hear this. We didn't hear of players having to go into a surgery. They get one, then two, then they have to go see a specialist because that didn't work. It just didn't happen. I'm not going to lay it all on the Ashna staff, but at the same time, honestly, something has to happen. And I've said it on, on the radio show and on this show. God forbid that, that the team was sold out because of a sponsorship. And we're seeing it with the Pelicans, with Tyreek Evans now. We're going to get into him in a little while. Uh, two surgeries, and, and then, of course, the now looking to have to go to a specialist. I've said it on my radio show. There's no way in the world, if, I'm, if, if, if I, these doctors are looking at me and I'm a professional athlete, that I'm not going to a specialist every single time right. they say I'm going, to, going under the knife. I mean, we have the Drew Holiday situation, which was another misdiagnosis. You talked about Jairus right. Bird coming with the back injury and then, uh, the, you know, the, the, the knee injury. So... I agree with you, and I've said it for a while. It doesn't seem to resonate with what's going on out there. I know that Peyton kind of glanced over it in his end-of-the-year press conference, but something's got to happen. There's just too much happening with both teams where there's right. injuries that are lingering, and, and then it seems to be a miss. At least we're looking at it from the media side right. to be a misdiagnosis. There's a lot of that going on throughout the league, and players do know that they've got to have their own medical staff got in to. addition to the team. I had a good conversation with Ed Reed about that that uh, there's some level of mistrust in, with, with, most with most teams between the players and their medical staffs. Uh, but every player's got to make sure they take care of themselves because every player is a corporation now. If you're an agent, you should insist. Oh, absolutely. Honestly, you should, it, it should be the first thing. And, and now with the track record we've seen in recent history uh, with, with, with this team, with both the Pelicans and the Saints, it would be automatic. True Breeze obviously going to be here uh, to finish out his career. That's a given. 
Uh, he will not play under the $30 million cap hit this year. They're going to extend him. $10.745 uh, $7, million bonus kicked in uh, for Drew Brees. I guess the question is, is it $20 million a year? Is it $25 million a year? What is going to be the base on, on, of his contract that we'll see? Obviously, uh, you can amortize a signing bonus over the life of the deal. Will it be a three-year deal? Will it be a four-year deal? Your thoughts on Brees? Well, and I, I look at, I love hearing about this, first of all, because I look at other quarterbacks that are really cashing in. Somebody like Joe Flacco yeah. of the Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> not, yeah, he won a Super Bowl. Not good for the Saints, though. Thirty-something million dollars, <laughs> you know, but... Again, you know, you just look at the overall value and what Breeze has been able to do, despite the injuries, despite all the criticism, despite everything, what he's done is nothing short of what his God-given talents would be. So maybe he's finding the sweet spot is in right in that $20, $25 million deal because he's got the endorsements. Mm -hmm. He's got all that stuff with him. But giving him money up front, maybe you can amortize it over the, you know, let's say it's another three years, four years of what they right. do for him. They're going to find a sweet spot to where they both win out right. on this one. And they have to because, again, you talk about the dead money. You talk about all the voids that they have across the roster. they got to find money some way, and that is the only way they're going to create massive money to land somebody, you know, right. maybe a, a, a high-priced guard, something like that. Right. Coach? Yeah. We have to believe in the American free enterprise system, just like Jari Evans. They're going to find out their worth. Uh, certainly, in his case, he's going to find out his worth out there. And uh, well, is not giving the, anything away in, is in the real world. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no his no, agent no, is no, not giving no, anything away. No, no, not at all. And, uh, and and with Breeze, it's going to be the same thing. They've got to be able to settle in. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised how late they get started. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm not. You know, not that I know how. In fact, I don't know anything about how all of that works. But it uh, it seems that they put that off way till till the end. It seems that they could have a bunch of balls in the air at one time mm -hmm. and be able to, to fit things in. But the, 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 the free enterprise system is going to settle in on what he's worth. The surprising one for a lot of us is the, the, the Jarius Bird situation. Uh, do $7.4 million this year. $6 million of that is now guaranteed, as, as the Saints have guaranteed that, that, that contract. Now, we talked a little bit about it before we went on air, and I've spoken about it on the radio show and this show. You know, Jairus, Jairus Bird, when you look at his at his contract, the way it was uh, as the highest paid safety uh, in the NFL, there were certain escalators he had to meet. He did not meet those escalators right. in the first few years of that deal, whether it's from injury, playing time, uh, performance, etc. So that, that contract is almost like a pay cut in some cases. Right. What will be interesting to see with, with the Bird situation is, will he be asked not to take a pay cut, but to restructure? It's possible. I mean, you just look at the whole grand scheme of things. That is a high figure. I think it was second or third on the team as far as their cap numbers for coming into this year. So you look at everything in the big picture. And again, when we were able to sign Jarius Bird, the expectations were this is the ball hawk safety. He's going to create turnovers. He's going to be this all pro safety like he was with Buffalo. Unfortunately, we had the injury issues. And then this year, I thought he did a good job. He was kind of one of those quiet, and when you got the uh, 31st ranked secondary, right. it's not really much you can celebrate on that. But I thought he did a pretty good job in some of the coverages and some of the you know disguises where he was able to fit in. But again, you don't get that player that has the turnover ability, like the track history that he right. had in Buffalo. You know, Coach, the interesting, and, you, and you broke the film down, the interesting thing about Bird is because they were so afraid of, of, people, of guys getting behind Browner, they almost made him play center <laughs> field. So yeah. you never have seen that ball hawking guy, the guy that was willing to throw his body around in a Jarvis Bird in a Saints right. uniform. I guess the hope is this year we'll see that out of Bird. Maybe he'll be a little closer to the line of scrimmage and, and won't be in the plaza section of the end zone. <laughs> in fact, the best break he made on the ball all year was a tip ball against Tennessee that went for a touchdown because I happened to watch him on that particular play, and he made an excellent play except that the ball got tipped up in the air and wound up uh, helping the Saints to lose. But he's got to be more fit than he was last year because I don't think he was ever uh, fully in NFL safety condition during the year and was was slow in his recognition mm -hmm. slow in his is slower in his movement than he's capable of doing so i expect to see a fitter and more trim gyrosburg uh candidate for restructure you think with the six is million there anybody base? in the nfl who's not well, a you know what that's a great point that is a great when you point. get when you get right down to it no doubt that's uh that's what separates good teams in the league from mediocre teams is what you do in the offseason putting a roster together well, Coach, and, and, and uh, John, I will say this. One of the things that you look at with this team going forward is they're in kind of a dilemma here because 
there are certain positions where you need a veteran presence. Okay, you we saw it in the off season. We talked about it before we came on air that. You saw guys that had to learn on the job in the NFL, young players who hit a wall, who have not been in the NFL weight room for a year, who are, are learning, in some cases, a brand-new system. And, uh, you know, uh, halfway through the season, their college season was over. And now you've got a, another half a season to be able to play in, in, in the pros. And, you know, we saw some guys that, that, you know, they were hit and miss. Some weeks they were playing well, some weeks they weren't. And they've got to get this defense under control here. And the big question is, you know, as they create more cap space, are they, how are they going to utilize that? Are they going to utilize that on a guard, you know, because you want to protect Drew Brees? Or are you going to look at the defensive line, which, again, is very difficult for a kid to come from out of college and play a long defensive NFL defensive line? Are you looking for that speedy linebacker a la Denver uh, on what, what they're doing there? So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. And then there are some other guys like Colston, Streif, Morstead, who are looking to probably look to have to take pay cuts. And then some guys that need to be restructured, probably like Cam Jordan and, and C.J. Spiller. Right. Your thoughts, Coach? Right. Lots, lots of work that still uh, needs to be done. But you're, you're exactly right with the, with the younger players. Uh, the spatial intelligence challenge in the NFL is unbelievable. What you ha it, it's learning, not only learning the language, but being able to adjust on the move and being able to communicate with, uh, with others. Uh, the coach is being able to communicate with you, getting the language right so that you're reacting instead of having to think about it. And so that challenge every week, and that's when they hit the wall. It's not a physical wall. It's a mental wall. I call it brain lock. Mm -hmm. That you're building, you're building, you're building, and at a certain point, your brain stops functioning for a while. And it's got to catch up with what's going on. Well, you're play, still playing games right. while that's going on. So that mental challenge in the NFL, and it has nothing to do with innate intelligence. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Einstein would have been a, a terrible middle linebacker. He wouldn't have been able to make the adjustments <laughs> no. at all, except on the board. Uh, so that, that challenge is huge. Let's hope that with the number of young people that had to play this past year, that, they, that uh, they're much further along. Because I would also have hope and believe that they're not going to change a lot in the terminology part of it. Because usually when you have a coordinator change, except at a place like New England, where they have an offensive playbook, a defensive playbook, a special teams playbook, and they may rotate the coordinators, but that terminology is not changing. Uh, when you change most of the other teams, when a coordinator changes, the language changes as well. And, every, and that's when you talk about learning a system, that's what it is. Uh, if they keep the same language in place, that's going to accelerate the learning of the younger players. Your thoughts uh, as they go into this free agency period, uh, you know, let's say they create, you know, fifteen million dollars. Okay, that that doesn't go a long way, but it's it, it is. Um, do you go after the defensive lineman, the, the the linebacker, the offensive guard, or do you rely on the draft? Well, I, I got to believe they're going to go heavy defense. Absolutely. And now here's what I think about it. And if you watch the Super Bowl, you obviously know front seven. If you can get a good front seven. So many good things happen for you. If they can get a good interior lineman, I think that's a huge need. You can look at free agency because, you know, Kevin Williams, he did so excellent for, you know, mm -hmm. the guy who's turned 35 and such. I mean, that's all you could ask for somebody. But, again, the interior pressure, you had somebody like Tyler Davison and John Jenkins rotate snaps. They get double teamed all the time. So if you can get somebody that gets up the interior, it opens up a lot of uh, options. And then off the edge, you know, you know Cam Jordan's going to come for yeah. you. But on the other side, you had Kikaha, who's, you know, unfortunately injured a good right. bit and with the an ankle. And then you had rotated out, uh, you know, Guachem. And mm -hmm. you had also Bobby Richardson. Right. So if you can get a veteran presence on that, I mean, and let's make no mistake about it, the draft has plenty of right. options for, you know, uh, defensive ends, defensive yes. tackles, which is a good thing. But weak side linebacker, that's where you really kind of one of those, you got to figure out, there's not too many options in free right. agency. So, again, those are two spots that you can really address in the draft, but you got to hit on them for right. sure. And, guys, those guys don't come cheap. Defensive no. linemen, pass rushers. Yep. I mean, if you're going to go on free agency, you're going to pay a pretty penny. And most of the time, those guys don't get the free agency. You know, right. they've been franchised by, by, by their opposing, by, by their by their current team. That's right. That's why the draft, and we're still paying for the sins of bad drafts. And it's going to be at least two more mm -hmm. years if we do, if everything goes right, to be able to get out from under all of those bad drafts, because you need to develop young players at those positions, and you've got to get the right free agents, not just any free agent. It's not always the best player no. that you could bring in, but somebody who has the skills that you need uh, for that particular position. When you look at Denver's model, they had three free agents, and the rest of their top 15 were all draft choices. That's right. And, and if you go back to the 06 model for the Saints, 
uh, drafted right. well, and the guys that they brought in fit what they were trying to do. They weren't trying to fit that right. square peg in that round right. hole or rolling the dice, hoping the sky was, or even throw the big splash out there to say we got the, you know, the highest paid uh, uh, right. person at their position <laughs> as well. Let's take a quick break. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports each and every Thursday night right here on WLE at 6 p.m. We have a rebroadcast every Friday night at 10 p.m. on WLE and on Pelican Sports Television in the New Orleans, Bat Rouge, and Lafayette markets, 9 p.m. every Friday night. Got a great panel for you tonight. John Hendricks of the Biloxi Sun-Herald and Who That Dish. Also, Rick Gailey of SportsNewell.com and WHNO-TV. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Don't go anywhere. Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... Located on Lake Pontchartrain, Brisbee's Lakefront Restaurant and Bar offers traditional West End favorites, a scenic view, oysters, and numerous tasty options. More information is available at 504-304-4125 or brisbeesrestaurant.com. Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House has been shocking here since 1979. Located at 3117 21st Street in Metairie, Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House offers raw, fried, and grilled oysters as well as a range of Cajun and Creole dishes. Enjoy a dozen with a smile. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is literally saving kids' lives. It's a very special place friendly place. And to see the kids that they're helping on a daily basis was unbelievable. Families never receive a bill from St. Jude. Discoveries made at St. Jude are freely shared. The hardest cancer cases in the world go to St. Jude. We won't stop until no child dies from cancer. Join us. Join us. In supporting hoops for St. Jude. Visit stjude.org slash hoops to find out how. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, tonight, John Hendricks of Biloxi Sun-Herald and uh, Rick Gailey of SportsNewell.com are our guests. Uh, we'll go to the phone lines in just a moment. 866-3200 is the phone number. Guys, your thoughts about the changing in the coaching staff, the addition of uh, Dan Campbell, Joe Lombardi, Aaron Glenn, uh, all guys that have a uh, at least a track record or a history with the New Orleans Saints. Absolutely, and uh, I, I'm most excited about Dan Campbell, obviously, because you know you look at what this player said about him at Miami. So uh, you know, such a good track record. Aaron Glenn is also who I'm really excited to see in the secondary. And again, you think about Aaron Glenn's time with the Saints when they brought him over in free agency, major whiff. Mm -hmm. But again, this is a guy who was on the downside of his career and such. But he knows the game. He understands it. He had some great prospects over at uh, Cleveland with Joe Hayden. And I mean, so he knows how to coach the secondary. So I feel really good about having somebody like him over McGriff. Right. The musical chairs of NFL assisted coaches. Boy, they just rotate around. Yeah, but like you can crazy. find a home. If, 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 you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're one of Sean's guys, you <laughs> always have a home. Well, he's got two of them that we know of. Oh, yes. That's a, story. That's a whole nother show. That is a whole nother and show. And I'm interested to see how the offensive line develops because that, it, to me, out of all the changes, that's the biggest change. Austin Johnson comes back. He's re-signed. Um, interesting because the way the league is going now, going away from the fullback. But uh, the, the Saints have utilized his talent, and he's been a pretty good special teams player for them. Absolutely, and you saw it last year that, you know, when you had Eric Lorg and Austin Johnson, they didn't have anybody because they went with uh, Michael ho o o mana o i I'll try saying that yeah, a couple times. That. <laughs> but they used him a lot in a football, job, uh, <laughs> football, a fullback <laughs> position, and, and, you know, they rotated a good bit on it. But obviously you don't have any of the three tight ends currently under contract with Josh Hill, Ben Watson, and, uh, you know, Human, if, as we call him down here. But again, Austin Johnson, great special teams player, good fullback. I think he could really bring some more. Uh, before we go to the phone lines, quick touch on the Pelicans. And, um, you know, it's amazing, but yet not, not really that amazing when you look at New Orleans and the love that we have for, for, for people who give back to our community. And, you know, uh, Coach, you know, I, I said it today on the radio show, and, and I think that we in the media become a little jaded. Uh, we're, we're, when we understand that pro sports is a bottom line business and a lot of times we don't think past the coach, the player, the general right. manager, they, they've, they're paid uh, handsomely to do a job and if they don't do the job then of course everybody wants to get rid of them and we've seen it. Monty Williams was, was an incredible person. Uh, and, and did a great did, did a great job for this community. And, and honestly, when you look at the way the Pelicans are right now, squeezed everything he could out of that team. 
But of course, his wife, Ingrid Williams, passes uh, in a car accident on Wednesday, a, a terrible tragedy. And if anything, I was so gratified to see the outpouring of love from the people in New Orleans who understood, number one, she leaves behind a husband and five children, but the fact also that uh, she gave back when she was here. Right. She, did a, she did a tremendous amount, whether it's nonprofits getting involved in the community, and New Orleans never forgot that. Absolutely. I mean, what a, uh, an incredible tragedy that is. It hit, she had three kids in the car with her, as a matter of fact, and uh, two of them got out uh, today, I believe. Uh, the third one's going to be fine. Both drivers were killed. She was killed and the driver of the other vehicle uh, as well. And I was listening to your discussion this afternoon. It reminded me uh, the difference between coaches, fans, and the media is that with the fans and the media, it's not personal. Uh, with coaches, it's not a business. It has to be personal. Uh, I mean, yes, it's a business, but you can't do your job unless you take your job very personally. And even though he got a job almost uh, immediately yes. and he was going to get paid, it hurts to get fired. Sure it okay? does. I can attest to that. I mean, I was at Tulane. Right. We beat LSU on Saturday, got fired on Monday. Right. Okay, so I can <laughs> tell you what that's like. And, but, uh, and then to have this happen within a nine-month uh, span as well because mm -hmm. they were very close. Yes. When you listen to the players, because uh, remember in the NBA, mm -hmm. half of your roster are really college players. Yes. Uh, the young players that you have to take, and they're all, they all come out early. So the, the, the head coaches' wives, while well, the whole, whole coaching staff's wives, play an integral role in helping these young guys and helping these young families to assimilate to an NBA lifestyle. And for, from all indications, she was a star. No, she really wasn't. Uh, John, I know you've heard the story of Ryan Anderson when, when his, his girlfriend committed suicide, uh, living with the Williams and, and, and basically, you know, sleeping on the couch and Ingrid Williams and, and Monty Williams being there, be, there for him. Uh, the transition for Anthony Davis to the pros of, uh, of Anthony being at the house, eating dinner, you know, being there one, as one of the, one of the family. It, it, it's, a, it's a tragedy, and, and it, when you think about what could have been, and, and, and of course, the, the loss of, of, of her life, it, uh, it's very sad. And, and, and look, one thing about New Orleans, you love New Orleans, we're going to love you right back. And, and today, we're, we're in mourning for, for the life of Ingrid Williams. Absolutely, and you just understand that sometimes it's bigger than sports. It's bigger than basketball, anything that's going around. And, you know, obviously, condolences to the Williams family and everything. That it, you know, It's an absolute tragedy, but again, you understand, even with Saints players and Pelican players, the ties and the roots, I mean, people love this team. And it's, it shows with their emotions, mm -hmm. definitely. No doubt Thank about you. it. Uh, let's head to the phone lines. 866-3200. Greg is in Homa. Greg, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Greg. Hey, guys. Uh, I got two quick questions. Uh, first question is, who do you think the Saints are going to fran franchise tag this year? And the second question is, I would like the panel to rank the first five um, needs that the Saints need by position. And I'll hang up and listen. Thank, thank you for the phone call. First of all, I don't believe they will franchise right. anyone. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to. Right, you yeah. don't have to. Don't I don't think anyone to. is worthy of a franchise tag that is, right. that is going to be an available free agent. Uh, guys, do you concur on that? Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. There, there's, you look at all the free agents, the pending ones, they can get them all back on a cheap dime. There's nobody you franchise for sure. Uh, as far as the, the needs, uh, one through five, in your opinion. For me, uh, I start with the weak side linebacker position because you don't know about Danell Ellaby. You hope he's safe, uh, you know, he's healthy and everything. Unfortunately, we'll have to see. Defensive end, edge rusher specifically, defensive lineman. I also put a kicker in there because I think mm -hmm. that's so imperative. And if you just look back over the McMahon 2006 on, you got to have a kicker, and they got a couple of great prospects coming out uh, that you know should be on their radar. And then obviously, I think another cornerback is going to be your biggest need. With Browner out, you don't have that certainty with Keenan Lewis. Um, you do have P.J. Williams again, the guy who's coming off a, a really serious injury that landed him on injured reserve in the first place. So that's what I got for you, Coach. You've got a you've got a uh, All Pro or a Pro Bowl caliber center. You've got a. a, a uh, franchise quarterback, you have running backs that you can, you have more than you need. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, every other position except left tackle is up for grabs. Right. And uh, so <clears throat> uh, the Saints really can select the best available player at each, at each yes. spot, but they've got to be able to identify who the best mm -hmm. available players are. And so that's where scouting and being able to rate the players is so important. You need game changers. 
uh, need an explosive player offensively mm -hmm. uh, still on the, on the perimeter. We've got a bunch of, of good players uh, there. And you've got uh, Cooks, who turns out to not be the short pass catcher turned into a, an explosive play. He's a down-the-field mm -hmm. pass catcher. So you still need some explosive player in the short and intermediate range defensively everywhere. You need, you need game changers. Right. I would say weak side linebacker and, and then ed, edge pass rusher, defensive tackle, offensive guard, wide receiver. That's, that's, yeah. That would be my list right there. You know, uh, and, and, and a bunch of healthy other guys. Ooh, you really need some. <laughs> guys, I want to get back to the Pelicans in a moment, but uh, I do want to ask about Peyton Manning's future. You know, it's interesting. Peyton Manning, uh, you know, goes out on top, uh, and, and now we hear inklings from Magic Johnson last night on Jimmy Fallon begging him to become the new quarterback for the, for the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, you know, you and I were talking about Joe Willie Namath, how he right. lived through his <laughs> career right. at, the, at the end for the L.A. Rams. Uh, he's due $19 million. Uh, it's one of those things that his money will be fully guaranteed if the Broncos pick up his, uh, his uh, option, and that'll be on March the 9th. Uh, all indications are is that he is going to retire. I'm hoping as a New Orleanian and as a football right. fan and as a Peyton Manning fan that he does retire. Coach, your thoughts. I've always thought that Peyton Manning was going to have to get carried out on his shield. The league is going to have to tell him, Peyton, it's time to go because he wants to play. He loves playing. He loves the grind, still loves the preparation. Uh, obviously, his skills have, have diminished because uh, he was mediocre at best, uh, even in the, the three playoff wins that they had, that his persona and his intelligence and his, his leadership helped uh, get the offense through in, in those three games. But he's, he's got, I could guarantee you that as he starts to feel better and feels more physically capable, that he's going to want to play the league, just like with Joe Montana. Mm -hmm. The league's going to have to tell him, sorry, Peyton, it's time for you to go be a GM somewhere. Your thoughts, John? Absolutely. I, you don't have anything else left to prove. I mean, you, you, you already, not that you weren't a, a first ballot Hall of Famer for sure, you absolutely stamped that for sure. In my opinion, it's it's over with. He, he doesn't have anything left to you know give as far as it goes. I know he's a passionate player, and we see a lot of that. But even a guy like Charles Woodson, unfortunately, comes to terms and, and understands when it's time. And, and Peyton should know it's time. He's got more money than he knows what to do with. So. Right. He Plus, just loves to play. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no denying that. You know, Coach? <laughs> and who's gonna, somebody's going to pay. Uh, I, know. <laughs> I, I played basketball until I was in, in my mid-30s, mm -hmm. and I loved to play too. But there was one day when I realized when I was going in for a rebound, and I looked over and I saw a guy's sneakers at my head level, and I said, you know what? Maybe it's time that I start thinking about maybe just heading to the sidelines. And, and yeah, you know, it just happens. I mean, you, your body physically cannot do it. The, right. the league is getting younger and younger. And uh, honestly, what he did it all was guts and, and, and his right. intelligence th this last year. And you know, I, I just, I hate to see him play another year, end up in a Los Angeles where he's going to end up being beaten up, yes. battered, yep. and then go out, you know, with maybe a team that wins four or five games. Man, you can go out on top. Right now, I mean, it's right. a storybook ending for him. And then he names what he wants to do. He wants to go into football down the line and be a general manager. I'm sure that option will be there. If he just wants to do endorsements for the rest of his life, he's got yep. Madison Avenue written all over him already. <laughs> yes, so indeed. I would hope that, you know, go out on top. How many people can say they went out on top? Not enough. And, 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 and he can do that. As far as the Super Bowl goes, um, it's a copycat league. You know, when the Saints won the Super Bowl, everybody wanted to, to copycat their offense. When you look at the Carolina Panthers and you look at the, at the Denver Broncos, the copycat there is the defense. Uh, the speed on defense for, uh, for obviously the, uh, uh, the, the Denver Broncos and just the overall, uh, again, talent that they have on the defense for the Carolina Panthers. Absolutely. And, and I, said, I told people before the Super Bowl, I said, I honestly believe Cam Newton was going to see a defense that he had never seen Ever, and, you know, just did that type of pressure, and that's exactly what they did. They took away all of his running space. You know, he had a couple of whims there, you know, but they uh, they put Von Miller to cover mm -hmm. a wide receiver, and he did great on it. I mean, they just have the speed and the talent to just keep up with the best of them, and ultimately it, it worked for them. Right. You know, Coach, I, I mentioned this before the uh, the Super Bowl. Give Wade Phillips two weeks to prepare for, for right. an offense. He's going to figure out how to shut it down. He did a great job. With that said, do you see an emulation now around the league? I mean, I could talk about some guys on the airline drive that should be looking hard at how Denver built this defense. The prescription's been out there for some time, and Denver didn't do anything that other teams haven't tried to do in the past. They were able to get away with man coverage. 
because uh, internally they could handle the running game with mm -hmm. six players, even though they played seven-man fronts a lot. They were able to do that. If uh, Carolina pitches a ball on the option about three more times during the course of the game, Denver's in deep doo-doo because you can't play man coverage and cover the option. Every high school coach in America mm -hmm. knows that. He only carried the ball six times. He was the X factor. They tried to beat Carolina, tried to beat the Broncos, just like Tom Brady was trying to beat the Broncos and didn't use what they had to the maximum capability, even though Den was excellent because, once again, they could, they could take the running game with six players. They had a player assigned to Cam Newton on every running down, and Carolina never made him pay for having to play so much man coverage. Back to the phone lines we go, 866-3200 to Kenner and Larry. Larry, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Larry. Hey, Eric. How you doing, my man? I know you got to be a happy man today. Austin Johnson is a saint. That's what I was going to tell you. I was going to tell him congratulations because he does watch your show. He told him he watched it. There you go. And uh, why can't Morton Anderson get into the Hall of Fame? He broke every record. He's the most accurate <laughs> kicker in, in the whole football league. And number two, uh, the Denver Broncos drank their kryptonite and knocked Superman for a loop. Yes, he we'll did. We'll talk to you all later. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Eric. Appreciate it. Guys, your thoughts? Three kickers in, in national football history uh, have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Last one was 1991. Uh, Jan Stinnerud, I believe, is who it was. But, again, Morton Anderson, leading scorer, probably a record will never be broken. Uh, you know, I question some of the – the selections on a Hall of Fame class, uh, you know, you can't overlook somebody like Kenny mm -hmm. Stabler for sure. But, you know, and Morton's got a good attitude about it. Mm -hmm. He'll get in uh, eventually. But honestly, you know, this is the what, third straight year right. we've been through this yeah. song and dance. So. Yeah. Yeah. so what is it, Coach? Is it Blanda, who went in as a quarterback and a kicker, or John Grosser. Stinnerud, and, and Ray Guy, right? right. Those are the as three. A as a punter. As a punter. Lou Groza as well? Yeah, but Lou Groza was, was an offensive yeah, lineman. Yeah, and right. he got a yeah, yeah, He, that was he got in as an right. offensive right. lineman. He was so, uh, a great. So, I mean, it's, they just count kickers. That's right. Like, yeah. It's just hard, okay, when you start looking at the classes that are out there and, and to be able to – I think eventually he will get in. But then right. they had the passing of Kenny Stabler. You look at everything else that went down there. Uh, I, I believe he deserves to get in. What, five players get in every year? That's yeah. the number that gets in. There's 24 mm -hmm. positions on a football team. When you look at wide receivers, they almost have mm -hmm. to line up. Mm -hmm. uh, they're only going to let one in at a time. They'll try and only let one quarterback in at a time. There's only so many. Yes. That with, with, with five and 24 uh, positions and great players, a lot of great players all over, but he's, he's the best that ever was. So, uh, you know, how many people, you know, some, they're going to have to leave somebody out yeah. uh, in a year to, to, for Eventually, him to get in. Eventually, you won't be able to keep him out because he will think. be on the ballot yeah. so many times that sports writers are going to have to say, you know what, it's time. Yeah. One thing for me that's going to be interesting to see, and when Adam Vinatieri finally hangs it up, is because you think, look at somebody mm -hmm. like him, I think the biggest difference for somebody like him versus Morton Anderson is all the Super Bowl rings right. that he has with the amount of game-winning you know, moments that he's had. So it's just something to take a look at. But, again, you know, kickers and punters, they don't get respect in the no. league, clearly. Right. Well, and, you know, sometimes they shouldn't get respect in the league. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> you know, when the other guys are out there getting their brains beat out, yeah. then all they're doing is go to kicking footballs on the side. It's called football. Yeah. All right? It's not air ball. It's not run ball. It's called football. Uh, <laughs> Let, let's shift gears for a moment to, to the uh, New Orleans Pelicans. From what we understand, I had uh, John Reed on my program this morning from NOLA.com and the Times-PQ, who covers the uh, Pelicans for uh, the Times-PQ. Dell Demps is now finally listening to offers. Uh, the sad thing is, we, we touched on it earlier in the show, uh, the situation with the health of the roster right now. Uh, Eric Gordon was expected to be moved before the trading deadline, uh, which is just a few weeks away now. Uh, he has the broken ring finger. He is supposed to be back before, uh, by, by the uh, All-Star break, the end of the All-Star break. The Pelicans will, will, will play as we are taping, uh, as we are, the show is live, uh, Oklahoma City tonight. Uh, and then, of course, they won't play again until February the 19th. Uh, Tyreek Evans, rumored this week, along with Amara Sheik, to be, to be moved to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, you know, obviously, that's out the window now with the possibility of, of Tyreek Evans shutting it down for the rest of the season. He will see a specialist on that knee before, before he goes into surgery. And the, the question is, at this point, you know, the only guy right now that, that, that maybe uh, a team would like to take a look at is Ryan Anderson. Can this team afford to move Ryan Anderson? Can they afford to keep him, considering, as someone told me on this panel a few weeks ago, uh, he maybe have to be your second highest paid player yeah. on the team, and is he worth that? 
it, it, there's a circular logic here because Demps has got to do something. He can't stand Pat with what he has, like he did in the offseason. Yes. Stand, stood Pat and changed the coaching staff because now, let's say he doesn't do anything. So that means that they're failing because of the coaching staff. Well, who hired the coaching staff? Well, he did. So it goes from him to the players to the coach back to him. So it's, it becomes a circular logic or as we, uh, it may be a circular firing squad for mm -hmm. all we know. And so he, once again, Demps is, the, is, is what is consistent in the equation and he's put together an iffy program at best. Yeah, and, and look, it's gonna, going forward, uh, there's always been the question since day one that we've discussed on this program and discussed on my radio show. Demps was all in on this team, continuity, okay? Right. A team that was predisposed to injury, that you're asking them to play in a very up-tempo uh, uh, type of style that, 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 again, wears down on a player's body. Uh, they were, they, these guys bought in because in the offseason, they, they were practicing together. Guys were just, they, they were getting injured. And now you're in a situation where do you really trust them as you get to the trading deadline to be able to make these moves? And then on the flip side, but can you let players like Ryan Anderson and Eric Gordon go with no compensation? Right. It's a catch-22 that they're in right now, and, and even a, a, a bigger catch-22 because of now Eric Gordon's health. Right. It's no easy answers. No, there really uh, isn't. For, for, for certain. And, uh, but you know, the person that's got to answer that is a, we're, we're depending. This is like the Corps of Engineers after Katrina. Oh. We're depending on the right. person that got us into the mess to get, to get us, us out. out of the mess. <laughs> but I, I don't know if, I don't know if if I am the hierarchy at Airline Drive. I am trusting him to get me out of it because you sold me <laughs> on right. Alvin Gentry and you sold me on continuity, and it hasn't worked out. So right. at this point, the, the the real question is, do you stand pat? Do you just let these contracts go? You relieve the bird rights off these contracts down the line because the salary cap will increase. But I'm only one that said, there is, I don't care if you got Anthony Davis or not. There is no superstar in the NBA that's coming to a team that's in the lottery. Okay? They're not doing it. They're not here to build. They want to walk into a ready-made team where right. they had a chance to win a championship. That's the way it goes. You got the three amigos, whatever you're going to do at that point. You got to be a, a championship contender. And, you know, even if you are to catch fire, which I doubt, uh, you know, and, and right. grab the eighth seed. Okay, you've made the eighth seed. You can chalk that up as we made the eighth seed. But you're going to get your brains beat out by Golden State. And because I'll be honest with you, this team right now to me is not as good as the team it right. was last year. And they should Th be There's better. been no progression. Right. There should have been progression. Yeah. And I, I think that's I, the biggest problem. I absolutely agree with you. There. Guys, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, John Hendricks of the uh, Biloxi Sun Herald and Who That Dish. And of course, Rick Gailey Thank of uh, WGSO Radio, WHNO TV, and also SportsNola.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember the rebroadcast of this program each and every Friday night right here on WLE at 10 p.m. and also on Pelican Sports Television in the New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette markets at 9 p.m. You can catch me on the radio, 990 a.m. WGSO weekdays, 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. You can catch us on the TuneIn Radio app, which is a free download for your smartphone or tablet. Also at ericasher.com where you can listen live, download the podcast, and you can check catch every, pre every episode of Inside New Orleans Sports Every single one, going back to our original episode at ericasher.com as well. Again, special thanks to our guests, John Hendricks and Rick Gailey. Also to our WLAE production staff, including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, Kenny Juno, Philip Williamson, Naila Jones, and my director, William Hill. New Orleans, thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you right back here next Thursday night for Inside New Orleans Sports. Have a great evening. Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is the first place award winner of the 2015 New Orleans Press Club's Excellence in Journalism Award for the category of Best TV Sports Show.